for my notes. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Will McCants. I direct the project on U.S. relations with the Islamic world here at the Brookings Institution. I'm very happy to welcome you here today. We're launching two papers this morning. The first is by Cole Bunzel. It's called From Paper State to Caliphate, The Ideology of the Islamic State. And the second paper is by J.M. Berger and Jonathan Morgan uh, called The ISIS Twitter, Twitter Consensus, Defining and Describing the Population of ISIS Supporters on Twitter. Um, we're just going to have a, a conversation this morning with the, uh, with the authors uh, and one of our invited uh, discussants. I'm going to introduce them. Uh, to my left is Anastasia Norton, who is a manager at Monitor 360 and an expert in counterterrorism and strategic communications. To her left is Cole Bunzel, uh, who's a PhD candidate in Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. Uh, to his left is Jonathan Morgan, uh, who's a data scientist and a senior developer at Ushahidi. Uh, and J.M. Berger to his left, uh, rounding us out, is a non-resident fellow uh, here at Brookings uh, and uh, um, author of a new book, <laughs> ISIS, the State of Terror, uh, which you can hear more about this month. We're doing a book launch here on March 24th that you're all invited to. So welcome to all of you. Uh, this morning, you can follow the conversation on Twitter. Our hashtag is up there. It's uh, uh, ISIS propaganda. Um, we'll also be taking questions uh, online, polite questions or, or not so polite. You can tweet them at US Islam. That's our, our Twitter handle. Um, I don't know if any of you have had a chance yet to, to read the papers. Uh, they are both uh, really marvelous pieces of research, uh, each in their own right. Uh, Cole Bunzel's paper uh, looks at um, a lot of the primary source documents uh, from the Islamic State, stretching back for years to the time before the Islamic State was called the Islamic State uh, and went by Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, J.M. and Jonathan's paper uh, uh, compiles a lot and creates uh, a lot of new data uh, on the ISIS Twitter population online and I think is the most thorough look at that population that we've had. We're going to start with Cole's paper this morning. Uh, sort of, uh, we've, I've asked Cole to give us an overview of ISIS's ideology um, because uh, for many people it's, it's still not clear. There's a vague sense that they are um, uh, global jihadists in, in some way uh, related to Al-Qaeda's vision uh, but on the other hand, I'm sure many of you have heard that uh, the Islamic State has been fighting with Al-Qaeda as well. So if Cole, I'd appreciate if you take 15 minutes to kind of walk us through your paper. Um, and perhaps as you're doing it, to give us a sense of some of the sources that you used in, in putting it together. Because it goes far beyond your usual media accounts and digs into a lot of obscure uh, Arabic texts and synthesizes it, I think, in a way that's really accessible to readers. Cole? Uh, thanks, Will, um, of course, for inviting us and for commissioning our papers, and thanks to my fellow panelists for being here. Um, I will talk about the development and ideology of the Islamic State or ISIS. Uh, since I only have 15 minutes, I'll just dive right in. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, I should note that the starting point of my analysis, as Will mentioned, is the importance of the Islamic State's own sources. Uh, of understanding the group on its own terms. And I stress this at the outset of the paper for two reasons. One is that the Islamic State takes a great deal of pride in its intelligibility, in the clarity of its message. Uh, when we discuss what makes this group attractive to potential recruits, which is not really something that my paper addresses, I think the intelligibility factor matters a great deal. Uh, Islamic State leaders are at great pains to make this point. The group's current official spokesman, a man named Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, said in May 2012, if one wants to get to know, if one wants to get to know the program of the Islamic State, its politics, and its legal opinions, one ought to consult its leaders, its statements, its public addresses, its own sources. I do not like this man, but I do agree with his point. Uh, the second reason that I stress the importance of the Islamic State's own sources is that there are just so darn many of them. Uh, it's really quite astonishing. Uh, to be clear, I'm not referring to the daily output from the group that we're used to seeing today, but rather the group's ideological production that goes all the way back to 2006. This includes, for example, 
17 hours of audio statements from the group's first two leaders issued between 2006 and 2010. It also includes a 90-page document from 2007 that is something of the group's founding charter. Um, likewise, there have been scholarly debates uh, among jihadis over the legitimacy of this group going back to 2007. So what does all this material, all these speeches, and all this literature uh, tell us? Um, for the purposes of this discussion, I'll try to focus on just three things. The first concerns ideology, what I call the Islamic State's brand of jihadi Salafism. Um, a lot has been written recently, as I'm, sure, as I'm sure you all know, about just how Islamic is the Islamic State. Uh, I've seen little discussion, however, of how the group, in its own words, inscribes itself into the Islamic tradition. It does claim, of course, to represent authentic Islam generally, but it also inscribes itself within a very specific and a very narrow tradition of Islamic political thought that is called, and it calls it itself, jihadi Salafism, uh, which encompasses both Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, and it's their term that the jihadis use themselves. Just to give an example, the Islamic State's leaders have described themselves as, quote, part of the current of jihadi Salafism and appealed to, quote, all the Sunnis and to the young men of jihadi Salafism in particular. So, in my opinion, we're not really at war with violent extremism, whatever that is, but rather with this particular uh, ideology. Uh, to give a little more background, jihadi Salafism is a school of Sunni Islamic political thought that, in my opinion, emerges in the later 20th century. It combines elements of both Muslim Brotherhood activism, such as the emphasis on restoring the caliphate with elements of Salafism or Wahhabism, such as the aversion to Shi'is and the desire to root out all, manifesta all manifestations of idolatry. Over time, however, jihadism or jihadi Salafism has increasingly emphasized this Salafi dimension. Salafism or Wahhabism, as you may know, is a purist movement that is largely native to Saudi Arabia and the Islamic State today emphasizes its most violent and exclusivist attributes and really claims the mantle of Wahhabism. It, it's, it uses very often the Saudi Arabia's own sources against itself. Um, so this very harsh version of jihadi Salafism begins with Abu Musab al qawi uh, the Jordanian founder of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, who founded that group in 2004. Um, and his heirs in the Islamic State today have consistently espoused this brand of his ideology. Well, Al-Qaeda, in comparison, offers an ideology that uh, might be called something like jihadi Salafism light, or what the Arab press is now um, starting to call moderate jihadi Salafism. <laughs> I've not, I couldn't believe my eyes. Um, but what makes this even a little more complicated is that the jihadi Salafism light, or moderate jihadi Salafism, of Al-Qaeda is actually, in my opinion, more threatening to the United States, being focused as it is on attacking the so-called far enemy, meaning us, whereas the Islamic State's brand of jihadi Salafism is more threatening to the Middle East, being focused on the so-called near enemy, meaning them, um, or Middle Eastern regimes in particular. I can talk more about this in the Q&A. The second thing that emerges from examining Islamic State's own sources is that the group is actually a great deal older than one might think. It did not emerge in 2013, but rather was born as the Islamic State of Iraq on October 15, 2006, precisely 3,071 days ago. And we know the exact number of days because since 2007, the jihadi forums that are online that I and will, of course, read uh, have featured a banner counting the number of days elapsed since this crucial founding moment. Uh, today, this banner reads, and I'll quote it, 3,071 days have passed since the announcement of the Islamic State and the coming hope of the Muslim community, and it will persist, God willing. Um, and you should, note that, you should notice that it doesn't say the Islamic State of Iraq. It says the Islamic State. So even though the official name of this group was in 2006, the Islamic State of Iraq was also known in shorthand just as the Islamic State, the same Islamic State that exists today. 
or what we like to call ISIS or ISIL. Third thing that we learn is that the Islamic State was intended from the beginning to do really exactly what it has done since 2013. It was founded, as the banner that I quoted suggests, with a view to becoming this long-awaited caliphate. It would begin as a proto-caliphal state, the kernel of the renascent caliphate, and expand from its base in Iraq to announce itself ultimately as the full-fledged caliphate, expanding across the world. So in my view, partly what makes the Islamic State's leaders so tenacious today, so persistent, and so violent is that for nearly eight years, until 2013, their state-building project was a failure and it was mocked as a joke. So only now are they fulfilling their original caliphal plan, and they're not going to let go of that uh, long-won success very easily. I should add also that it's not just the Islamic State sources that show how old the Iraq-based caliphate strategy is, but also official al-Qaeda documents some of which were never intended for us to see. I'll talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, OK. So indeed, there was actually a kind of joint Zarqawi al Qaeda project for developing a caliphate in Iraq that goes back to as late as, or, to as, late, as late 2001. Can you say something quickly about what the caliphate is? Yeah, uh, the caliphate is the word that in, in Islamic law is kind of coterminous with the global uh, Islamic empire. It's supposed to be a unitary state that is expansionary, um, and it is you know, described in, in the legal books as, as the kind of ideal Islamic polity that would have one, one leader, one head, and um, ultimately you know, kind of go across uh, the world. And the, it, it's also kind of coterminous with the original Islamic State founded by the Prophet Muhammad in Arabia in the seventh century. Um, but it has had also very different meanings across time. But I can't get into all that. Um, so right, what I wanted to say was that this, this plan for the caliphate, the renewed caliphate, um, was conceived in late 2001 or early 2002 uh, by Zarqawi and by Al-Qaeda in, of all places, Iran. Um, following the in Afghanistan invasion, um, the US invasion of Af Afghanistan, Zarqawi, who was not a member of Al-Qaeda at the time, he fled Afghanistan to Iran, and he discussed his plans there uh, to relocate to Iraq and to found there a proto-caliphal state. He spoke with a man named Saif al-Adl, who is a senior uh, al-Qaeda operative, an Egyptian. And according to Saif al-Adl, they both agreed at this time that, that Zarqawi should go to Iraq and found this state. So from 2002 to 2006, both Zarqawi and al-Qaeda were really on the same page when it came to this caliphate strategy. Um, and it would ultimately, they said, become the caliphate, first starting as, as a state in Iraq and then expanding. And in 2005, as I've been able to find, three Al-Qaeda leaders wrote Zarqawi urging him to establish this state in Iraq. Saif al-Adl Ayman al-Zawahri and a man named Atiyat Allah al libi or Atiyah Abdul Rahman. Um, and Zarqawi himself spoke repeatedly about setting up this state and in April 2006, he even said in a video that I hope within three months to be able to found an emirate in Iraq. Within two months, however, he was killed. Nonetheless, the caliphate strategy went ahead. The state was founded in October 2006. Um, it was known, as I said, as the Islamic State of Iraq, but it was also seen as a larger project, as the Islamic State that just happened to be in Iraq for the moment, but would ultimately expand farther. So the ambiguity was deliberate, in a way, this play on the Islamic State of Iraq versus in Iraq, is it the caliphate or is it just a state that's confined to these national borders? That was intentional. Yeah, I think so. And the, the original leader of the group, a man named Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, he, he took the title Amir al-Mu'minin, or the commander of the faithful, which is in Islamic history the term used for caliphs. Um, so while he didn't say in 2006, look, I'm the caliph, um, 
he certainly wore a kind of caliphal garb and used caliphal nomenclature. Um, there was a lot of ambiguity there. Um, to get back to this, uh, the reason, however, uh, we see the Islamic State not as having been founded in 2006 is that until 2013, we tended to call this group Al-Qaeda in Iraq, or AQI. And conventional wisdom tended to, to hold that AQI really just changed its name to the Islamic State of Iraq in 2006, that nothing really fundamentally had changed, um, and that the Islamic State of Iraq was really just a front for Al-Qaeda. And both regional and Western media insisted on the AQI label. And if you listen to the speeches of these leaders at the time, they're actually quite furious that they're not getting any recognition for being a state. They complain, stop calling us Al-Qaeda. We're a state now. Even Ayman al-Zawahiri said, look, there's no such thing as Al-Qaeda in Iraq. The state building project has commenced. However, they evidently did not get any recognition as a state. And even jihadis ridiculed them at the time for being what they called a, quote, paper state, um, which is exactly really what it was. It was an insurgent group masquerading as a polity. Until, of course, the events that we're all familiar with, the expansion to Syria in April 2013, the conquest of Iraq, or much of Iraq, in summer 2014, and the caliphate declaration at the end of June. Um, and the upshot of all this is, well, I'll finish with three things. The first is that the caliphate declaration in 2014 was a long time coming. Uh, Will has mentioned this point before, so I'm plagiarizing him briefly. Uh, it was shocking, yes, but what it really did was to bring to fruition a plan that was conceived 12 years prior. It formalized the Islamic State's caliphal status, which since 2006 had been ambiguous. The second point is that the Islamic State is not really, and this is where I think I disagree with Will, this, it's not really, in my opinion, an al-Qaeda offshoot or a spin-off, as it is commonly described. Um, at the very least, the situation is much more complicated. The relationship between al-Qaeda and Zarqawi and his heirs has always been very troubled, as I document in the paper. In addition, uh, Zarqawi and now ISIS, uh, they've always represented this much more severe form of jihadi ideology than al-Qaeda has. Uh, something that is evident as far back as the 1990s when Zarqawi set up a training camp on the other side of Afghanistan from bin Laden and seemed rather um, wary of being too close with him, partly because um, he didn't think that bin Laden uh, was willing enough to her hereticize or get, pronounce takfir on the Saudi family. Um, today, the Islamic State claims, and possibly with justification, that it never pledged fealty to al-Qaeda, or Bayah. It might be more accurate to say then that it is actually al-Qaeda that walked away from the Islamic State, and not the Islamic State that walked away from al-Qaeda. Uh, the third and final point I'll make concerns leadership. Um, the Islamic State's success since 2013, while well, contingent on numerous factors from the Arab Spring to the Syrian Civil War, does seem to me um, inconceivable really without the current level of leadership that the group has. And I don't think this gets sufficient attention. Um, I mean the impressive quality of the current leaders. The so-called Caliph, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the speaker, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, and the young Bahraini ideologue, Turki al-Bin Ali. These men are, objectively speaking, learned, eloquent, and most important, effective. Whereas their predecessors, Abu Omar al-Baghdadi and Abu Hamza al-Muhajir, who died in 2010, were none of these things. Um, these men didn't even really pronounce Arabic very well. I've listened to all their speeches and made notes in the margins of all the errors that they made. It's, it's remarkable. The current leaders would never do make such, pro, uh, make such errors. Um, also, the first Baghdadi, Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, was for years rumored to be a fictional character played by an actor. And even the US military bought into this at one point. So if you listen to his speeches, he's often saying, look, you recognize my voice. I'm not a fictional character. I'm a real person. And it's just astounding. So I highly doubt that if these incompetent men were still in charge of the Islamic State today, that the group would have done so well since 2013, which is to say that jihadi leaders are not billiard balls. It matters who's in charge, and that it would be significant if these men were eliminated. Thank you. Thanks. Um, JM. 
another factor for uh, that's often cited in the in the media for uh, ISIS's success, particularly in attracting uh, foreign fighters, uh, has been its use of social media, uh, especially Twitter. Um, so, uh, I mean, do you do you agree uh, with that with that assessment? I mean, does, has has Twitter had that big of an impact, or has it just had an impact in shaping Western perceptions of the ISIS threat? I think it really has had a big impact, and not just Twitter, but media, uh, all media, going from their propaganda releases, their their written text. Uh, Obviously, Twitter is, is kind of the easiest one to get your head around in a lot of different ways, both technically and conceptually. Um, but certainly, you know, they're also on Facebook, they're on Instagram, they're on Tumblr, uh, everything but MySpace. So um, I think that... Uh, they even have a Pinterest page. Uh, that would not surprise me at all, actually. Blogspot, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and more. And they're trying to create their own and... Uh, media is important to them. Uh, projection is important to them. One of the things that uh, you know I've come to conclude over the course of the last six months and sort of sitting down to write the book and, and be really intensely invested in this and thinking about it for, for so long is that the projection of an image of strength is critical to the success that they're having. And uh, I think that the, the caliphal Dressing is, is also obviously a, a crucial part of that. Um, but their ability to put that message out and to project a, an image of invincibility and an image of power is the reason we see ISIS succeeding in ways that Al-Qaeda didn't. Um, and I think that it's very deliberate. And I think it, you know, the underpinning this is a, uh, is a decision to invert the traditional extremist narrative. So, you know, extremist groups, identity groups like this that have a very high level of exclusion and violence toward outsiders, over the course of time, over the last 100 years, 150 years, uh, what we've seen is those groups generally are, are built on a narrative of weakness. So we're under attack. Our identity group, whether it's white people or Muslims or particular ethnic group in a, in a country, it's we're under attack, we need to defend ourselves, we need to use these extreme tactics because we're not strong enough to fight back and, and take control ourselves. And, and ISIS has turned all of that on its head. Um, they are keeping the exclusionary identity, but they're saying, sign up with us because we're winners. And uh, the contrast to that is pretty sharp. When you look at the messaging of Al-Qaeda, when you look at its external messaging propaganda, uh, you know, people who are interested in jihadism have never had a message like that before. And then it's combined with this extreme level of violence, which is going to be exciting and agitating to a certain, certain potential kinds of recruits. And uh, the ability to project that message is part of this. So you can, you can have the world's greatest propaganda piece, but if nobody reads it, who cares? Um, and so that's where social media comes in. And, and Twitter has been... Uh, the most visible place that this has happened. Uh, Twitter has risen to the fore for a couple of reasons. Uh, first off, out of all the different large social media platforms, it has been the least inclined to interfere with the activities of its users. So Facebook and YouTube came under fire earlier in this process because they've been around for longer, uh, around the time that Anwar al lakis videos were really exploding, and that sort of forced them to have the crisis of confrontation with this and what are we going to do about the presence of material advocating violence on our platforms. So they have mechanisms now that are built in that, that involve terrorism. You can flag a Facebook post or a group or a YouTube video for supporting terrorism and that's grounds for suspension. Twitter did, does not, still does not have a specific category of offense that is related to terrorism that you can report an account and have it suspended. Uh, so as the pressure increased on all these other platforms, ISIS supporters moved to Twitter in very large numbers. And, uh, you know, they were supported in that. They had a, a very, they have a very smart strategy. The people who run it are technically minded. They understand social media. Uh, they use a lot of manipulative tactics to, to get their message across. Uh, they understand how to game the system. And they have enough numbers to do that. So 
as a as a we set out to sort of define this group um, for the paper, and because for some time now people have been talking about this at, at a very loud volume sometimes without any really having any kind of concrete numbers that were derived in any kind of transparent way. So you you turn into a story and some company says, oh, ISIS has 100,000 supporters on Twitter, but you don't know where that number comes from or what they mean by supporters. And uh, in addition to that, the Twitter had in September of last year started to really crack down on these accounts after the James Foley beheading video was released. And they began a program of suspensions and it's, it's sort of renewed a debate that's been going on for some years now, really going back to the forum days about whether it's better to take these guys offline somehow or whether it's better to leave them online for so we can collect intelligence from them and do suspensions do any good at all in the first place to suppress their message. And uh, this is a, a, an often heated discussion that is almost never informed by real substantial data. And since Twitter is very friendly to understanding it in the context of data, this is a good opportunity for us to sort of pick this up and, and look at that question. Uh, so we found, unfortunately, if we had started uh, two months earlier, we would have had a perfect comparison set pre-suspensions and post-suspensions. Uh, unfortunately, Twitter started suspending these accounts about a couple of weeks before we started collecting information on them. So what we have is early suspension data versus later suspension data. Uh, so it's not a, we didn't get a perfect comparison, but what we did see is that there are really some patterns going on. So we found a total uh, from the amount of time it took us to collect the data and analyze it was about a month, a little bit more than a month. And uh, over that period of time, we were able to estimate that there were about 46,000, a minimum of 46,000 ISIS supporter accounts active on Twitter. That included some accounts that were suspended and, and subsequently returned. So it wasn't like on any given day, there wasn't necessarily 46,000 accounts. Damn, is there a person behind each account or, or some of those? We didn't try and tackle that problem. There are ways that you can sort of address it, but uh, certainly some of these accounts have multiple, one user keeping up multiple accounts. Um, I don't think a statistically significant percentage, but the most active accounts and the most visible ones that we end up talking about a lot are, are often going to be that kind of situation. So, you know, where you would see that more often is in this group of users that, that ISIS calls the Mujtahidun. Uh, these are industri the industrious users. Uh, they're about 500 to 3,000 at any given time Twitter accounts that tweet all day. They tweet hundreds of tweets a day. Uh, they tweet the same material over and over and over again, uh, very consistently. And those users are the whole reason that we talk about this at all. They're the ones who are able to make uh, videos disseminate through the network very quickly. They are the ones who were, before the suspension started, able to you know, insert ISIS content into unrelated hashtags. So last June, if you were searching for World Cup, hashtag in Arabic, you would get pictures of ISIS executing prisoners. Uh, if you search for Baghdad in Arabic after the fall of Mosul, you got a banner that said, we are coming Baghdad. Uh, that kind of activity is really fueled by, by those 500 to 3,000 accounts, and a lot of those accounts are probably single user controlling multiple accounts. Um, so those accounts, we found, were also the ones that were being targeted most heavily by sus in the suspensions which is probably organic. It probably, we don't know for sure how, exactly how these suspensions are coming about. Um, to some extent, users are reporting it. There are organized campaigns of people who, who report ISIS accounts now and then flag them for suspension by Twitter. Uh, I, I tend to think that Twitter is also taking some initiative in suspending these accounts. Uh, but however it's coming about, and I think it's probably organic, uh, the, these Mujtahidun accounts are the ones that are really getting, uh, getting slammed. Um, we found that on average, uh, the accounts that were getting suspended had about twice as many accounts as, as followers as the ones that didn't get suspended. And uh, they received 10 times as many retweets and they tweeted about four times as often. So 
a good way to get suspended if you're an ISIS supporter is to have a lot of followers tweet all the time and get a lot of retweets and be very popular. So this stuff is having an effect on the network. And again, we, you know, we, with some serious caveats for, for imperfect comparisons, what we found was that the network was functioning less efficiently. Um, we saw that retweets received from people inside the network dropped pretty substantially and retweets from people outside the network increased slightly from uh, October to about January. Uh, when I say out of the network, what it means is people who were not, uh, when we analyzed these retweets, we would like, we collected the people we knew were ISIS supporters and all of their friends, and that's the network. So when you get network in-network retweets, you're getting more retweets from ISIS supporters, basically. Out-of-network retweets, in this case, does not necessarily mean they're not ISIS supporters. These are also new accounts because of the amount of time it takes us to do the analysis. Uh, some new accounts that popped up would show up as out-of-network. So we saw different, you know, we looked at a lot of different metrics, and we saw essentially it looked like to us like there was a, a drop off in most of the most of the metrics that you would use to, to measure success here. Um, except for one, which was number of followers they, they had, and I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Um, what we also saw was that the, all this hashtag spamming activity has pretty much come to an end. They still try and do it, but they can't do it anymore. They can't generate the volumes that, that are required to show up in a search result or, or get your hashtag aggregated. Um, in fact, the last time I saw the ISIS hashtag being aggregated was when an army of Japanese spam bots started feeding malware into the system on the, uh, on the official ISIS hashtag last week at very high level of volumes. ISIS is now, as opposed to June, last June at their peak, this was a really powerful force of large active counts that were mostly untouchable and operating at a very high volume and they were able to dominate discussion. And what we see now is that they're vulnerable to, to trolling and spamming and we're seeing a lot more people do that. So uh, there are companies in the Persian, Persian Gulf that sell retweets. You know, we're seeing like retweets in Arabic that says, bunch of Dash guys got killed today, ha ha ha. And then somebody pays to get you know 10,000 retweets of that tweet and it pumps it into the, that network. So ISIS is often getting outperformed on its own hashtag on a daily basis now, sometimes by four or five to one. Uh, so I mean, that, that really to me is one of the most dramatic uh, impacts of this. Um, we also saw that new account creation has, has dropped off, although there's some up and down with it. Uh, in September, when the suspensions really started in earnest, there was a, a spike in the creation of new accounts. Um, so, you know, we counted in the first uh, set of 20,000 accounts that we used for our demographics analysis, we counted about uh, 3,000 accounts that had been created in September. And a lot of those were probably new accounts that were being created in response to suspensions. Um, since then, it's dropped uh, with the exact numbers. We don't have a perfect comparison set, but we basically saw it drop to about a third of the level that it was in September, and then started to creep back up in January and February as suspensions got more aggressive again. Um, we don't know, completely know how many suspensions have occurred. We were able to count a thousand suspensions that we were sure were ISIS supporters. Uh, and then there were 18,000 suspensions that because they were suspended at a certain point in our process, we weren't able to get enough data to tell if they were ISIS supporters. Based on a statement that Twitter made to the New York Times last week, I'm inclined to think that most of those suspensions are ISIS supporters. And certainly, uh, given that a lot of these accounts will pop up and get knocked down very quickly, there's probably even more than that. So by any measure, if you look at that estimate, the, if you take the 19,000 estimate as, as a low end kind of figure, and you compare it to the accounts created and, and just you know, assume that we're not capturing all the accounts created, suspensions are outpacing uh, new account creation. And so when we went to recreate the network, we, we tried to do a, a, you know, to create this comparison group, we wanted to create a, a very similar group. And so we use similar starting point to try and collect a new network. And what I found was is that I had to keep widening the criteria for the starting point to get any kind of concrete numbers. 
So in the first one, we used about 450 seed accounts. We collected everybody they followed. And that gave us 49,000 accounts, out of which we were able to estimate about 30,000 were, were ISIS supporters. So when I went back with a similar number of seeds that were selected in the same way in January, I got 15,000, and then I did it again, and I got 20,000, and I got 22,000. So the network is shrinking, uh, you know, and, and we don't, one of the reasons for doing this paper was to sort of propose a methodology where you could create a set that we could monitor on an ongoing basis and create truly good comparison data. So, I mean, I think that's a next step ahead in the research is to sort of take this and then implement it on an ongoing basis. But what we see so far, I mean, it's very encouraging. Now, the one thing, you know, possible dark side in this, uh, aside from, you know, the many complicated issues around suspensions, everybody has opinions about it. There's, you know, it's, there's a free speech kind of issue. There's also a perception issue. Um, a lot of, I've gotten a lot of pushback on, on our assessment that suspensions work, which reminds me of discussions over climate change is like snowing outside my window, so global warming doesn't exist. You know, the data here is not, not the perfect data set that I would have liked to have, but it's way more data than anybody else has looked at on this subject. So, you know, it's just because you're following some ISIS accounts that are tweeting successfully doesn't mean the suspensions aren't accomplishing something. One thing that they're accomplishing that may not be desirable for us is it's pushing these guys into a box. So as you suspend these accounts, when they come back, they're more and more focused. They follow the essential ISIS accounts. They're not going to follow as much noise. They're not going to spend as much time building up a follower list because they know they're going to get suspended again. So essentially what we're seeing is they're talking more and more to each other and less and less to outsiders. And ISIS is a very extreme group. It's not as susceptible to outside influence as other groups would be to start with. But this social dynamic could be creating an environment in which it's much more risk of radicalization once you get into the network. So it's harder to get into the network. It's, you're, the content's not being broadcast out. They're not drawing in curiosity seekers in the same way that they used to. But if you get into the network, you're, you're entering a giant echo chamber of epic proportions. And you essentially, you know, it's becoming a much more insular community online. And I think that, you know, one area that I would suggest is a good place to study going forward would be to really look at how accounts that enter the network behave, how quickly they follow other accounts. You have to be able to sort of distinguish. I think there's a pretty distinct pattern at this point. When you see an account coming back from suspension, we could, we could tag those pretty quickly by the speed with which they accrue followers. Uh, but if, if a new account enters the network, you know, what's, what's the path for that person? And sort of look at, look at that and see if, you know, letting them be on here at a reduced level uh, so that we can preserve our intelligence gains but, but keep them from broadcasting as effectively as they used to. Is it going to have some side effects? It's, just, it's, it's essentially social engineering. When you manipulate somebody's social network, it's, just, it's an act of social engineering and we have to understand the behaviors will change as a result of that. So, I mean, I would like to see or, see or do some study of that going forward and, and see some of those effects. Thank you. Jonathan, um, I have two questions for you. One is uh, just doing the, the nuts and bolts research uh, for, the, for the paper, you know, the, the, the big buzz phrase that's gone around, at, at least in the government for the past few years, is, is, is big data. Um, and it's particularly talked about in the context of, of social media. Would, would you, my first question is, would you describe this project as a, as a big data project? Um, and and the, my second question is, is more abstract um, and, and really, in many ways, impossible to answer. But nevertheless, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask it. Give it a shot, um, though. Uh, does any of this stuff, uh, any of this propaganda going out on, on social media, does it, does it have any real effect on radicalization? And, and, and how, how, how would you be able uh, to tell? Sure. Well, to answer the first question, it's difficult to put big data in context. 
because it's such a widely used term. So for shorthand, let's say it's anything that you couldn't do on your laptop. You'd need some complicated computing machinery. And for me, we're right at the edge of that. And I think what we like to talk about in these sorts of questions is, or in these sorts of problems, is that whatever you're doing, regardless of whether you'd label it big data or not, start with a question and then get the right amount of data to answer your question in the most simple way. And so for us, I don't know that I would label this as a big data exercise because we didn't need to get into that territory in order to capture the data that we did and reach the conclusions that we were able to reach. Um, I'd say to take this further, to do an even more expansive look at a much larger network, then we'd be approaching, we'd be approaching something that would be more like big data, and then it, it, it'd become a more complicated procedure. The reason that I think that kind of research would be important kind of leads right into your second question, is that I, I do think um, that there's a clear relationship between the type of propaganda that ISIS is publishing and the degree to which they're able to target vulnerable individuals who are sort of ripe for radicalization. And what's really interesting, uh, what's really interesting about the, the types of data that we're able to collect from a group that operates so heavily on a social network like Twitter is that we can, in effect, reduce radicalization to a numbers game. So we're quantifying behavior in a way that wasn't possible before. And can you, Jonathan, can you see people <laughs> on, the, on the sort of the margins of the, of the network moving towards the center over time? We can definitely recognize and quantify behavior, just that, right? And that's sort of what's interesting about this, I think, is that there's a certain amount of reading of tea leaves when you're digesting messaging only, only content. Right. But if you can actually observe an individual's behavior in some way, then to me, that's a, that's a very clear indicator of their path. Their behavior in relationship to people we know are hardcore uh, ex supporters of an insurgent group or a terrorist organization. Yeah, absolutely, because these are, these are network structures. So my proximity to a particular group of people, my interactions with them online. At, as that online and the, my proximity to their network online, and as that sort of user moves closer and closer to that group and their behavior changes, that's a quantifiable difference, and that's sort of where this, that, I think that would be a valuable next step for this sort of research is to look at that trajectory over time and really understand how it is that somebody becomes radicalized in a quantifiable way, not just um, maybe in addition to the more qualitative discussion that we usually have about this sort of thing. And I uh, just yeah. I wanted to add to that. Uh, I mean, I think the evidence for radicalization on social media is pretty overwhelming at this point. We have you know, dozens to hundreds of cases of people who were introduced to this material on social media, recruited and made their plans to travel and coordinated their travel, all of that happening on social media. So that part, I mean, is, is pretty straightforward. I think, you know, one thing that we need to think about when we start creating a typography, you know, for the next stage of kind of research on this is creating a bestiary of different kinds of accounts. Because not every account's gonna follow the same track in the same way that not every person follows the same track on radicalization. So some people will, graduate, will gravitate into sort of the centrality of the network, whereas other people, and for instance, I, I looked at uh, the Belgian uh, sleeper cell uh, suspect who was being discussed a couple of uh, months ago, and he maintained multiple accounts, some of which were way on the fringe of the network and others of which were very deep in the network. So understanding, you know, when we we know who some of these people are and we can go back and look at their networks and we can build a profile that we can use to look at new people coming in. Right, and so Anastasia, that, that brings me to my next question, which is about how the government uses this kind of data. I mean, I remember when I was at the, the State Department and, and you know, asking the intelligence community for a sense of, of how um, how members of extremist organizations were, were promoting themselves and their causes online and how they were connecting to one another. Um, uh, there, was, there was an appreciation in the intelligence community uh, for that kind of data, but I, I, I also got the sense that um, uh, oftentimes a lot of those agencies weren't, um, that wasn't their primary focus, and they were still pulling in uh, other sources of, of data, not, not open source, uh, to inform the kind of analyses they were doing. And I wonder if you can uh, talk about, um, in, a, in a general way, um, 
how the government uh, and how the analytical community on the outside has to adjust its way of thinking about um, uh, uh, extremist organizations um, given that they are connecting with one another in, in real time online, in, in full public view. Because this is different than what I was working on just 10 years ago where a lot of these discussions were happening behind password protected forums that were owned uh, by uh, extremist communities uh, uh, themselves. They had a lot more control. Now you see a lot of these same folks moving into privately owned uh, um, uh, social networks owned by companies, how, how does this change the way that we, that we um, study these groups? Yeah, I think, well, that's, that's sort of the, the key question for me. Um, I would say over the last um, decade, the intelligence community, the national sec security community, got really good at what I would say, I'll, call, I'll borrow an analogy from a really good friend of mine, hunting at night. They got really good at sort of developing tools to uncover clandestine networks, wherever those were online, um, in, in the physical space as well. Um, and those, that requires um, a particular tool set, right? So you can imagine like really powerful flashlights that you know, they can sort of shine in dark corners and figure out you know, who do we need to look at, who's important in this network, who's having an impact. But I would say with ISIL's rise over the last several years, and their, the extremist community's move to social networks, to these very visible places, we've now, I think, shifted into this era of hunting during the day. And hunting during the day requires a completely new skill set and completely new tools to be able to use to sort of shine, um, shine a light. Um, we don't need lights anymore, right? We, need, we now need a way to separate signal from noise. Um, and I think sort of the work that, um, that uh, my fellow participants have, have done really helps us sort of think through that. Um, the company that I'm with now, Monitor 360, we've been trying to really think about this and figure out what are the tools that we can use in this open source environment to help us distinguish between um, all of the noise, right? There are a lot of people online now talking about um, ISIL, spreading ISIL propaganda, but for what purpose? And can we really point to a change in offline behavior? Um, and, and so that's one of the things that, that I'm really interested in sort of thinking through. A couple of questions that I just wrote down that I think are incredibly important for the national secu security community and for analysts um, outside as well. Who and what matters online? What tools can be used to triage information in this um, online space? How do we discover influential networks and nodes? And what do we mean by influence? Um, how can we measure effectiveness and resonance of extremist propaganda? How do we get better at predicting where rhetor rhetoric may actually translate into action? So where propaganda or what I'm seeing online may actually cause me to travel to Syria. Um, or to um, you know, sort of take over, do an attack in my own country. And then how do I, and this, this is one of the places I think is richest for, um, for uh, investigation. How do we identify the different roles online? So if you can think of um, terrorism as a system, right? We understood the system in the outside world, right? You've got leaders and foot soldiers and funders and facilitators and trainers. That's what exists in sort of a terrorist system. What does that terrorist system look like online? Who are the, who are the people that are um, initiating the propaganda? And I think James' paper gets to this, right? Um, the, the official accounts. But then who are the ones that curate that information, that spread that information? So really thinking about the different roles someone may play online, and then how you go about countering that most effectively. Um, also looking at sort of role movements, you know, what you just mentioned, the, the ability to move from one part of a network to another. Do we see that translating um, into, into offline behavior? Um, at, at Monitor, we're, we're really trying to think through these meth methodologies and to try to couple social network analysis with content analysis, with longitudinal analysis, and with sentiment analysis, right? How can we combine 
all of these different tools we have access to to understand the online space in a new way. Um, does that, you know, can we develop methodologies that really help us understand influence, who's influential, who, not just someone who gets retweeted, but someone that can actually inspire and motivate me to travel to a comfort zone, for example. Thank you. Uh, Cole, one, one of the things that's really striking about ISIS, particularly in contrast with uh, the other Al-Qaeda affiliates, is it's, um, it's, it's not really pitching its message uh, to the masses. I mean, it, it is much more narrow casting uh, and, and, and using acts of extreme brutality. One is a deterrent uh, uh, to outside enemies, but, but two, as kind of a calling card to attract uh, uh, young people who would be interested in that kind of extreme violence. You went through a lot of the Islamic State's documents where they were trying to justify these extreme acts, and they, they pull a lot on the Islamic tradition to do so. And I, I won't ask you a, a big question about how Islamic the group is, but I, I wonder if we can get at it another way. What, what is the specific tradition, religious tradition within Islam that they are drawing on um, uh, to justify their actions? And in, in what ways are they departing from tradition uh, in, in order to um, uh, uh, justify um, extreme acts of brutality that, that don't always uh, or oftentimes seem to be in direct contravention of Islamic norms of warfare? Sure, that's a big question. Uh, so. If you read the, the ideologues, both the official ideologues of the group and the ones who are more amateur, amateurish ideologues, many of whom are anonymous online and have Twitter accounts, um, they're very uh, clearly um, trying to appeal to uh, Salafism. They identify as the only true Salafi Muslims. And they often use a lot of the literature that is produced in Saudi, uh, has been produced in Saudi Arabia since the 18th century, which tends to focus on things like the necessity of killing all the Shia, the importance of destroying any kind of manifestation of idolatry. Um, just to give an example of the way that they, they kind of appeal to the Islamic tradition in defending their brutality, the, there are a lot of, of accounts I'm not sure how much you guys deal with these a lot because I'm mostly interested in ideology. There are accounts dedicated solely to ide ideology, and their productivity um, is really astounding. They produce so much material, it would be impossible to read all of it. They produce every week books, uh, essays, and poems defending just about everything they did. So following the, uh, the immolation of the Jordanian pilot recently, um, I've counted at least 12 essays, the longest one being about 50 pages, um, that have been issued by these sort of amateur um, Twitter media agencies. One of them is called the Strangers Media Agency. It's the most popular, and it today is on its 15th account. Um, um, and they, you know, they dip into scripture and, and to the legal history, and they often, you know, they do adhere to or try to adhere to a very particular um, Islamic tradition, um, but that tradition is mostly theological. So it's about, you know, what is God and, and what are his attributes and things like that. But when it comes to, to brutality and, and acts of brutality, they'll just look at any, um, any Islamic jurist over you know, the 14 centuries of Islam who might have said something favorable about immolation, for example. Um, and there are a lot of them. And so they quote all these things, and they say to the Islamic State's opponents, um, what, you know, what are you, how could you possibly uh, accuse us of, of not adhering to tradition? Um, it's right here. It's in the law books. And in one instance, they even uh, republished a an essay on the permissibility of immolation that had been published previously uh, by a scholar um, in, I think it was the Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia. Um, and just said, look, we're not even worse than these people. Um. And J.M., and I'll throw it open to questions after this, this one, but J.M., um, are, the, are the ISIS uh, fanboys online, are, are they just 
constantly pushing ISIS talking points? Um, or do they, do they ever generate their own that kind of make it up the organization? And also, do you see any give and take with the outside world? Do you see any ISIS supporters saying, hmm, I hadn't looked, thought of it in that way. Maybe I'm, I'm changing my mind, or are they all pretty, pretty much in lockstep? <laughs> so uh, basically, as far as the, the first part of the question, um, the fanboys are, are pretty copiously full of ideas. <laughs> so they're, they're always pitching. Uh, it rarely, rarely gets up to the top level. Um, usually the stuff that trends within this closed community uh, is stuff that's being pushed by their, their social media team and their social media activists. Um, there certainly some of their, you know, for instance, there's like a varying degrees of officialness to their media outlets. So Alpha Khan is official, official. And then you have like Azority Media that's not really official, but it's super, super popular. And that's out of all of them, probably the most influential of the not officially sanctioned accounts. And that doesn't mean that he's not actually officially sanctioned, but he does not claim to be officially sanctioned. Um, so in terms of uh, sort of the more inside, outside, you know, is there is there signs of dissent in here? The fanboys are pretty consistently on message. Um, and the most visible accounts and the most prolific accounts are pretty consistently on message. There are clusters of smaller accounts where actual conversations happen and where a certain amount of, of doubt is expressed. But it's pretty unusual to see that reach any kind of critical mass. So you'll see little perturbances of, of controversy here and there. Um, along the fringes of the network, uh, within in the inside of the network, really in the interior where a lot of this interaction is taking place, not so much. When it does happen, uh, they flock over. I mean, you know, they swarm over a guy. So uh, I think it's pretty difficult to be a, an ISIS dissenter. Uh, I was really <laughs> interested in the, uh, I was really interested in the fatwas that uh, Cole translated last week on Jihadika because that short as, in a way is a much more clear sign of, of where some of these internal fault lines probably exist than what they are, people feel comfortable seeing in public or on social media. So, because, you know, I presume that a lot of this thought was, came from people asking questions like, can I go home now? And, you know, that was like, how many of those thought was were, no, you can't go home? Uh, three. Three, so, uh, you know, <laughs> it's more than one person asking the question, so. Uh, they're, you know, it's it's not a real tolerant group. <laughs> Even okay, if you I'm, belong. I'm going to throw yeah. it open for uh, for questions now. We've got a got one right here. Name is Stephen Shore. It is, I believe, not an uncommon phenomenon for people. You chip. Uh, typically, young men to believe they have found absolute truth and risk their lives in the name of a sacred cause, whether this is people like Lafayette and the American Revolution or um, the, the um, Abraham Lincoln Brigade in the Spanish Civil War. But always there is a what I call the God that failed syndrome of people who, however fervently they believed, come to see the era of their ways. And I'm wondering if the U.S. government has any means of um, debriefing people who have reach the, the God that failed state of, of mind. Thank you, and I'm gonna take uh, two more questions and we'll come back to the panel. Yes, here. Hi, uh, my name is Yvonne Pliss. I'm a reporter with the Daily Caller News Foundation. I wonder if anyone on stage uh, heard about the latest uh, attempted move to platform. Uh, there was a Khilafa book that uh, you know, some ISIS supporters tried to start up on sort of a do-it-yourself social media platform and was taken down, I think, less than a day later. Anonymous may have been involved. Um, are you sort of seeing a, something like this or sort of other attempted uh, realignments, moves to other platforms as Twitter is becoming increasingly policed? Or sort of, uh, if you've heard about this in particular, I'd love to hear your take on it as well. Go right behind you. Hi, Matthew Wallen, American Security Project. Um, my question uh, involves uh, questions of uh, credibility, both in uh, counteracting the uh, the ISIL and ISIS Daesh messaging, 
um, and whether or not those counter narratives are considered credible, whether they come from other parts of the Muslim community or whether they come from, uh, say, U.S. government efforts. Okay, so we have three questions, one sort of an exit ramp question, another do-it-yourself social media, can it work, and then the counter narratives. Jam, I'm going to start down with you, and if any of you want to wave off, just, just wave off. I'll skip you. Jam, go. Okay. Uh, as far as the exit ramps, I think we are doing, we have, we have some uh, capacity to, to debrief somebody who leaves ISIS. We don't have any capacity to help people who want to leave ISIS. Uh, Say we, is, the United States. Yeah, yeah. and we, there's some variation among different countries, but I think ISIS presents a much more difficult challenge for everybody on this because of the nature, the extremity of what they do. Uh, you know, most notably in my experience with talking to Omar Hamami, uh, who, is, he, who was the American who joined al-Shabaab and then split with them and, and was afraid for his life. And at various points during my uh, discussions with him online, I, I was trying to encourage him to, you know, try and cut a deal. And at the same time, when I talked to people in government, I was sort of like, you know, even if he's not going to take it, you guys should offer him a deal because he's not a, a, an offender in a way that uh, is irretrievable and you want to kind of set a precedent that people can leave Al-Qaeda without having to spend their whole lives in jail. And there was no interest in that, zero interest. In fact, in the middle of my conversations with people about that, they announced a $5 million reward for his capture or death. So that's where that stands right now. Uh, Jonathan, if, oh, you want I just want to say on the Khalafa book, uh, it's this every two months, or, or more often they come up with their new, they're going to start their own social network. Uh, they all pretty much go like this. Yeah, John, what, what, what about the do-it-yourself social network? Well, I was actually going to speak to that as well. I think, A, those are difficult to do, and so they often fail. But B, it also kind of misses the point. There's a real utility in having these conversations in public if the goal is to radicalize foreign fighters to come join your fight. So there's really no... This idea that we would go set up our own social network and that would have some utility for the organization, I think, is kind of a misstep in the first place. So that's a, another reason why I think that they don't do particularly well is because they don't attract the attention from outsiders. That was really the point of being on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube in the first place. Perhaps. I mean, that's a little bit outside of my area of expertise. These, <laughs> these particular things, these like Hilafa book, and I think they had one called Muslim book before it, uh, are not official ISIS operations. They're done by supporters on their own initiative. There are official ISIS OPSEC-related websites and, and forums that they use that are separate from, from this. Paul, you want to speak to any of those? Uh, not on exit ramps or, or, the, or the platform. What about the counter-narrative stuff? Particularly religiously discrediting ISIS. I mean, they're pretty awful. They're pretty beyond the pale for most right-thinking folk, uh, regardless of religious persuasion. I mean, do we need to exercise, or does anyone really need to go after them on religious grounds? Well, I think, yeah, I think it is important to address their, their religious claims, particularly because one of their, their talking points that I read every day is that, look, we're, we're actually dealing with, with Scripture, and we're actually... Um, you know, drawing on the legal texts, and our opponents are just calling us unbelievers um, and just saying that we're not Muslim. And uh, there is probably a point to what they're saying in that um, it would be more effective if people could argue with them um, chapter and verse instead of just with slogans. I also think that it's probably a mistake for the U.S. government to try and discredit the group's kind of Islamic credentials um, particularly uh, the president's comments um, several months ago to the effect that the Islamic State is neither Islamic nor a state. Um, that's gotten an enormous play among, among ISIS supporters who are, are very want to call um, Obama, the, this is their words, the mule of the Jews. Uh, it doesn't, I think, help to have somebody um, like that uh, with, with that perception trying to um, basically talk about, act as if, as they say, he's a mujtahid, as if he is uh, a learned Islamic scholar capable of declaring who is and who is not within the bounds of Islam. Um, okay, thank you. And Anastasia, you want to tackle either of those? Yeah, so a, a couple of them. I'll, I'll start with the credibility issue. Just, we were just talking about that. Um, 
A couple things. One, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think the U.S. government is necessarily the best credible voice on, on talking about um, who is and who is not um, Muslim. I do think, however, that if we shift the frame um, to be not about countering belief, but instead countering behavior or trying to influence behavior, it becomes less an issue of credibility and more an issue of influence. Um, so I think you can imagine a lot of areas where the U.S. government or U.S. government communicators might be influential. Um, they may not be credible with that audience, but but they, you know, when the when the president comes on the TV and talks about, um, you know, sort of different policies that that we're going to take in a particular area or how we're going to react to particular things. Um, you know, he's got a lot of credibility there, and potentially that can have influence on someone's behavior, um, even though it may not have influence on someone's belief. But I think too often we fall into this sort of linear trap where belief um, is the beginning and behavior is the end, and I, I don't think that's necessarily the, the best way to look at it. I think that behavior... Um, belief is often used to justify, justify behavior. So we can start with a behavior and end with a belief. So, so I think that's something really, really important to, to keep in mind when we talk about what is the best way to counter groups like ISIL and, and their messaging. Um, as far as disillusionment um, and the ways that we can think about exit ramps and how to use that in strategic communications in particular, I think that's a very... Um, rich area, and it also leads to this credibility issue. Someone who's become a part of the Islamic State and then has left and has really clear grievances about that, they're, they're credible on that issue. Um, and I think any way to amplify those messages, I think some of our European government partners um, you know, are thinking really, really long and hard about how best to do that. Um, but I think those are, those are things that, that we need to explore. Um, all right, thank you. I'll take some more questions from the room. Yes, in the blue. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Spath. I teach at American University and fellow at FPRI. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have uh, kind of two questions just both, both related to production. Uh, so the first has to do with the idea of ambiguity versus intelligibility. I'm just wondering if you can talk more about this, probably for Cole, but for anybody. Uh, if you can kind of discern where... The, the message is, you know, particularly intelligible versus where there's ambiguity, right? Because we heard that there's both of these kind of at play in terms of the production of uh, ISIS's message. Um, and so ambiguity over what the state is, uh, intelligibility over the ideology, how does it, how does it fall? Um, and then the second question on projection has to do with one of the purposes of projection, right, which is legitimacy. It's not the only purpose, but one of them. And we heard about uh, produ uh, kind of producing a message of strength. Um, and, and then we also heard about producing a message of religious legitimacy, right? But then one of the others uh, has to do with um, competence and governance. And so I'm just wondering if you can speak to that as part of the production of the message, competence and governance. Thank you. In the green? Yes. Um, in ISIS's um, discussion about the caliphate, how important is having a single caliph? Thank you. All right. Over here. Uh, regarding ISIS leadership, uh, many reports, many people think that the leader is... Um, you speak up, sir. Uh, many people think that the leader of ISIS, the face of ISIS, Baghdadi, is not the real leader. Um, one of the former jihadists said that while meeting with uh, Abu Umar, uh, Abu Hamza al-Masri, we mentioned him, he told them that we choose a caliph, we chose, we chose Amir al-Mu'mineen, but we can change him anytime you like if you don't like him. Is that true? Thank you. Thank you. And then a few from... Hi, we have a Twitter question from someone watching on the live feed from Belfast, and he asks, is the degree of violence that ISIS employs and transmits as much to ensure loyalty of its current members as it is to taunt the West? Okay, thank you. 
All right, so uh, Anastasia, we'll start with you this time and we'll go down the line again. So we've got a question, uh, two questions um, about messaging. Where is, it, where is it ambiguous? Where is it clear? Um, also, what do they have to say about governance? And then the other, the other question uh, about their messages is, you know, what's the purpose of, of broadcasting these high-def videos of, of violent acts and snuff films, so on and so forth? And then another question or a series of questions about the, uh, about the caliph. Is this, how important is it to have a, a single caliph? Um, and also, is, is, this, is the current Baghdadi just a, a, a prop uh, like his predecessor, or is he a, a, a person of flesh and blood? So Anastasia, you can have a shot at any of those you want. Sure. I'll actually, I'll try to cover the, the messaging questions a little. I think that one of the things ISIL is most adept at are developing and tailoring different messages to different audiences, right? So they're able to hit a variety of motivations because they do draw on religious justifications, their strength, their ability to, to govern. So they hit a wide variety of motivations that may be attracting um, people to. Well, you want to tackle the, the Caliph question? Uh, yeah, well, there were a couple. First on intelligibility versus ambiguity. Um, the point really that I was trying to make is that um, when the group first set up its state in 2006, um, it Try, it portrayed its status as ambiguous, whether or not it was the caliphate. And that seemed to be a very deliberate strategy. But after the caliphate declaration in late June 2014, uh, all of that ended. And that's why, if you read the, uh, the appendix uh, to my report, I have an initial list of, uh, which is kind of a, a creed that the group has uh, distributed since 2007. And all of those 19 elements are still um, very intelligible and unchanging things. But then there are a few other things that only apply once the ambiguity ended and the caliphate was declared. Um, but uh, interestingly now, it's uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri and al-Qaeda that has sort of adopted this ambiguous caliphate strategy. And now, uh, since 2014, since summer 2014, al-Qaeda has presented uh, Afghanistan, or what it calls the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, the Taliban, as the ambiguous seat of the caliphate in almost a, the exact same way that uh, the Islamic State of Iraq did this uh, to itself from 2006 to 2014. Um, the question of single caliph, uh, there's a, a legal maxim um, in, in Islamic law that says if there are uh, two if there's one caliph and a second caliph is given an oath of fealty, you kill the second. So um, ideally, now this wasn't always um, applied and people justify the presence of there being more than one caliph, but when it comes to this group, uh, it's definitely following the one caliph model. Um, <laughs> uh, as for the, can there, you know, we change the caliphs, um, the, the point that the gentleman made is, is absolutely right when it comes to, to the first, uh, Amir al-Mu'minin, or proto-caliph Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, um, and Will writes about this in his new book that's coming out. Uh, the, the, the real leader, probably, of the Islamic State of Iraq was the Egyptian who was known as the war minister, Abu Hamza al-Muhajir. And he wrote in a letter to the al-Qaeda leadership that, yeah, we just kind of chose some guy, and you know, we'll call him Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, but if, if he doesn't work out, we'll just replace him with another Baghdadi. And uh, that does seem to have been the case for the first iteration of the group, but I don't think that that's the case with the current leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Jonathan, you want to take a shot at any of those? Yeah, I, I can speak to the messaging questions, I think. I think it's also important to remember who the intended audience is for those of us consuming um, messaging from ISIS in the West. Is, and I think that narrative actually ends up being relatively clear, both to the, um, the um, the capacity for state building through to uh, the, the very extreme violence uh, that's projected across social media and other channels is that for the sort of person who's vulnerable to radicalization, this is a very compelling narrative. So you're talking about somebody who's in a position where the extreme violence is very exciting um, and this black and white worldview where things could be simpler, things could be better for me in an established, uh, in a state where everything's functioning properly. It's some sort of idealized version 
um, of an Islamic State. That's, uh, I, I think that's where, that's the through line through a lot of this messaging. And I think it's important to remember who that intended audience is for those of us consuming their media in the West. J.M., you, you and Jessica Stern write in your new book about this strange combination of two themes that don't, you wouldn't think go together. One is ultraviolence and one is civil society. And uh, you can see both of those as themes that run through their messaging. How do they reconcile them or, or are they trying to? Well, I think, you know, what Jonathan said is, is very true. I think that what you have is you have a, a, a sort of image of this perfect society that is carefully constructed in some of their propaganda. And some of their propaganda is focused primarily on, you know, this is how we govern, this is what it's like to live here, everybody's so happy here. And then you have this extreme violence and they're self-justifying. So, you know, because it's this perfect society, we're justified in doing extreme things to prevent it, which is a recipe for attracting psychopaths, which is something that the Islamic State seems to be pretty good at. Uh, they also have different streams of messaging for different audiences. So, you know, there's the big videos that get attention in headlines, such as yesterday, uh, the latest video they issued showing a, a child executing an alleged spy. Um, then there is a, a constant daily output of updates from different towns, and, and these are all designed to sort of reinforce the legitimacy of the government. This is like, here's the nursing home, here's the police station, uh, here's the market, look at all the food we have. Fish, I think, was one that was going the other day. I kept seeing pictures of fish going across my Twitter feed because there were fish at the market. And uh, so those are for a local audience. And some of the extreme violence content is also for a local audience. Uh, so uh, the clanging of the swords being most obviously showing how this can work. It's not necessarily, I don't think they're trying to keep their dedicated membership in line. Uh, I think they are trying to keep the people who live, who are unfortunate enough to live there in line and uh, the, the armed forces that might oppose them, so. Okay, I think we've got time for two quick questions all the way in the back. Thank you, Mohammed Al Minshawi. I just wonder, do you rally in your uh, analysis and, and uh, understanding on Arabic material? So the panelists, do you speak Arabic and read sophisticated Arabic or rally, you rally on Translated English material. All right. And then one more quick one. Yes, please. Mustafa Gurbus uh, from Rethink Institute. I'd like to ask about the role of the Sunni grievances in Iraq and the larger Middle East um, uh, regarding the receptivity of the message itself. Uh, it will be for a call. Um, as far as I understand, the ISIS is more like a revolutionary social movement group having terrorist acts in which we do see a clear land claim of a land and concrete goal. And uh, so it is related with a clear message for the involvement. So uh, could you please uh, make some comments on the Sunni grievances? So um, let me just put this note. Uh, maybe not convinced with the Mahabi message, but convinced with the Shia's Shia danger as uh, demonized in, in, in their mindset. Okay, so we have a, a narrower question about Cole's cred as, a, as an Arabic reader. Okay, so he can read it. And then a broader question about the grievances that are, that are fueling um, the, the rise of the Islamic State, or at least, or at least um, uh, making the environment easier for them to move in, particularly uh, in Western Iraq. And, and Cole, I'll start with you, but anyone else who wants to, to weigh in on the, on the grievances question. I'd also personally be interested in hearing about the, the other side of the world, the Europeans that have flocked to the Islamic State, are, are, are there um, some of the things that they cite as grievances different than what's being talked about from the foreign fighters that come from the, the Arabic speaking part of the world? But Cole, you first. Uh, yes, I, I speak Arabic. I studied Arabic for more years than I'd like to admit. I lived in Syria for more than a year, just studying classical Arabic. Um, all of my, almost all of the sources relied on in my paper are um, primary Arabic sources, almost all of which have not been reviewed previously. Um, and when there are translations available, I tend not even to look at them. Um, and at the end of my paper, there's a whole lot of, of translated uh, material that's all translated uh, by me. Um, the grievances question. Grievances. Yeah, so 
Uh, yeah, it isn't all about Wahhabism. I definitely think uh, at least equally important is, is the narrative um, which fits Wahhabism or fits uh, Salafism's anti-Shi'i biases. Um, so one of the, uh, the narratives, probably the grand narrative that ISIS peddles is that there is a sort of Shi'i plot to take over uh, the Arab, the Sunni Arab Middle East and to keep the Sunnis from really taking power. And um, they also think that the United States is complicit in this plan. They think that our invasion of Iraq is really uh, just a way of handing power to the Shia in Iraq. They think that the nuclear deal that we're uh, currently negotiating with Iran is really just a way of kind of formalizing Iran's Shi'i hegemony over the area. Uh, they perceive the United States to be bombing exclusively Sunni militants, but never ever bombing uh, Shi'i militants. So it's a huge part uh, of their narrative and it's, it's extremely effective. Yeah, and, and, and Jonathan, J.M., how, how, how does this compare with the, 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 the grievances that are being cited by, say, the European uh, foreign fighters who are coming to fight under, under the ISIS banner? I mean, there's, there's definitely different streams of uh, messaging and complaint. And one of the things that's really, you know, and I'm sure you've had this conversation a million times as I have, is like, you know, people want to have simple explanations of why radicalization happens and there there aren't any. Um, there are clusters of, of causality. So, you know, in Iraq, Sun, Sunni disenfranchisement is a, a huge issue that allowed ISIS to gain a critical strategic advantage. But then, you know, when you start to expand the circle out to include, you know, they have this remarkable appeal in, in Europe and, and in, in the West where those issues are not forefront. And, uh, we we went we had some pretty rousing arguments in writing the book <laughs> about this issue and we dragged a lot of our friends into them and uh, you know we we ended up with kind of a very minimalist discussion of it because it, it was impossible to settle it uh, there's there's really I I'm sort of toying with an idea that needs to be flushed out but about changes basically like it, cultures and societies where there's a change in status, for good or for ill. Uh, societies in transition being being the place where where radicalization can thrive, uh, and it ha would have to do with how you accept that transition. Whether you perceive that there's an increasing amount of persecution on you, or you perceive that your your identity group is on the rise, uh, and and those are the kinds of you know. If, in as much as you can tease out any kind of consistent thread, I think it's somewhere in there. Anastasia? Yeah, just to, to sort of build on that, I think there's a lot of um, opportunity analytically um, to really think through what, how we're going to use narratives, right? So narratives as a unit of analysis, but narratives also as a way to frame how we're looking at this problem. Um, and I think one space in particular that, that is very useful for thinking about how to best counter groups like ISIL is the idea of framing the analysis to understand what is the overlap between these different narratives, or say an indigenous population, the audience that ISIL is trying to appeal to, and then ISIL's narratives. Where are the overlaps? Where are the potential overlaps where you may see resonance? Um, but what are also, what are the friction points? Where do you see divergence? What are things that we can amplify um, in those different spaces that increase those friction points um, and, and where we can see the divergence? And I think that is a really fruitful area for um, continued. Okay, well, please join me in thanking the panel. I think it's been a great discussion.